Hey, it's Josh, and in this video, I'm excited to say we'll be going through the first lecture of the Plutus Pioneer Program, hosted by the IOG's Director of Education, Dr. Lars Bunyas. You can find a link to the lecture in the description below, but on a high level, we're going to take a quick overview of this lecture. Specifically, we're going to talk about all the extended models of using Cardano and some of the benefits and cons versus other blockchain like Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then we're going to go through the homework, which is just setting up an example so we can run our own Plutus Playground locally. So if I need delay, let's get started. The first thing that was discussed in the lecture is the unspent transaction output. Uh, the first example is that if we were given a bank and someone had to withdraw, let's say $10, we just subtract 10 and then our bank balance would be updated to be 90. And that's how banks work today. But this isn't the case for Cardano and other cryptocurrencies where we have a completely different address. Now onto the actual unspent transaction output for Cardano. I'm just giving a quick summary over everything Dr. Bruno's talked about in a short video. If you want the full information, I highly recommend looking at the video. For Cardano, if we want to make a transaction, we have something called an unspent transaction output. So unlike a bank where we just have one payment, Alice and Bob has a wallet where they have all their ADA, but for each wallet, there's a unspent transaction output, which stores all the ADA for each user. Now, let's say Alice wants to send 10 Cardano to Bob. Instead of just subtracting 10 from the wallet, we actually do something else. We make a new transaction. So what happens is Alice would make a transaction and the transaction will have two outputs. One, it would be the output to Alice's wallet, so 40. And the second one would be another unspent transaction to Bob, which contains the 10. How the UTXO works, for every transaction you make, you can make partial transactions. You actually burn up your existing UTXO, and then you create new UTXOs to the different users. So in this case, Alice has a new UTXO with an amount of 40, and Bob has an additional UTXO with an amount of 10 Cardano inside of it. Specifically, Bob's wallet now has two UTXO. It has the original 50 and the 10 that Alice gave him. An interesting point that was also brought up is let's say Bob, who now has two UTXOs, wants to send 55 to Alice. Well, each individual UTXO does not have that many Cardano. However, we can actually combine our inputs and make a transaction. So we can use both the 50 and 10, which adds up to 60. And remember, because transaction requires all the UTXOs to be spent, we can't just use all our 50 and take half of our 10. We have to use the full UTXO. And then the output of this would be Alice would receive the full 55 and Bob would get five. And so at the end of the day, Alice now would have two UTXO, the original 40 and the new 55 that Bob sent her. And Bob now has spent all of his UTXO, so these are gone. And now he has a new UTXO in his wallet with the amount 5 inside of it. Improving upon the UTXO model, we have something called the extended UTXO model. So for a normal transaction, a user would, would consume their UTXO. But to ensure that Alice is actually who Alice is, Alice would need to provide some form of verification or a signature for the most common cases to validate that she is who she says she is. And that can solve most cases. However, the part where the extended comes in, instead of using the plain old signatures, what if there is some logical condition? Let's say there's a script that actually handles the verification of the user. And that script would have some arbitrary logic that decides whether or not this transaction should go through or not. And what this script is, is actually our Plutus contract. So what goes inside a script? Once again, for the full detail, do look at the lecture, but each script would have something that it's called a redeemer. A redeemer is just an arbitrary data. It can be anything like integer, string, it could be actually a complex data type. It's used in your script to figure out if you should complete the transaction and unlock your funds. And so that's half the puzzle to this Plutus script. But there's another concept called datum. So a datum, just like the redeemer, is also an arbitrary data. It can be an integer or string, three, the letter A, 
for example. And it's also another input that Alice can use to send to the script that can be later used to compare with the Redeemer. So to recap, and to add customizable functionality to the script, users can create two types of inputs, a datum and a Redeemer to help the code decide. From reading the documentation, a datum is usually the data that the initiator of a transaction sends out. For example, if you looked at some of our older videos, for example, a guessing game where a user would lock up, let's say a couple of ADA, like five ADA with the password one, two, three, the datum here would be one, two, three. And then another user who wants to redeem the datum, they would guess the password one, two, three, and this one, two, three would be the redeemer. And then the script would check to see if the datum that the first user uses matches with the redeemer. And if it does, it'll release the five that the first user, let's say Alice, locked up to give to the second user, Bob. And this is how we use smart contracts when sending ADA from one user to another. Now, one interesting point that was talked about in the video is the difference between Cardano, Ethereum, and Bitcoin smart contracts. Disclaimer, I have not written a smart contract for some of these languages, and so all my information mostly comes from the lecture itself. However, let's say we have this whole series of transactions that takes part in a smart contract. In our first transaction, Alice sends 10 ADA to Bob and keeping 40 for herself. In our second transaction, Bob sends 55 ADA using the whole 50 he originally had and the 10 extra that Alice gave him. And he gives that to Charles. And then that would give him a remainder of five to himself. Let's take a quick look at how each of these platforms handles this transaction. For Bitcoin, Bitcoin is actually more simple where all those transactions that we made, it's actually scoped down to a very small couple of things. To verify if the data is correct, all Bitcoin gets is the input and a redeemer value, which could be any data to figure out if the transaction can be successful or not. So when looking at that bigger picture, this is a lot smaller in terms of scope. The benefit of this is that when using Bitcoin transactions, it's very hard to mess up, but the con is that just because your scope of information is limited to only your input and your redeemer, there's not a lot of extra logic you can use to make Bitcoin intelligent. Now for Ethereum and Solidity, it takes a completely different approach from Bitcoin, which was very limited. In Ethereum, you actually have information of everything. For example, let's say we're at transaction two right now. When writing the smart contract for transaction two, the, the developer will have all of the information needed. They have all the redeemer and the datum that the user might have sent. They have information about transaction one, specifically all of the inputs used in transaction one and all the outputs. And it also has information about the output of transaction two, which would go to Bob and Charles. And the pros of this is that you see everything in the transaction, which allows you to basically write code that handles any situation that you want. You can maybe say for transaction two, that transaction two only works if the first transaction, the user received 10 Ethereum or less or something like that. However, as you can imagine, the cons of this is that, for example, you can say something like for the second transaction to pass, the, in the first transaction, the user must have a input that is greater than 40. That is a lot of power. However, detriment to all this flexibility is that there's a lot of ways for the code to go wrong. For example, we might say that there is actually two inputs, one from Alice and maybe another one from Bob, and then the you and the developer coded something wrong and didn't account for Bob, and then the co the whole entire smart contract fails. And of course, this is just a silly example I made without actually understanding the solidity programming paradigm at all. So please don't flame the comments if this is incorrect. I appreciate it. Thanks. Now on to the main show. We talked about Bitcoin, which had limited information. And then we talked about Ethereum, which gave you everything. The Cardano team chose a middle approach. Instead of letting the developer see everything, they limited the information they can see to only each transaction. So for each transaction that the blue script is writing, 
the developers will only have a set of information. They'll have the user input, they have the data redeemer, they have information about the transaction itself, and it, they have the output information. Developers won't be able to have any past transaction information or future transaction information. The argument for why this is a superior model is that we still have a lot of information to allow developers to create flexible code. However, the information that developers get is not so large so that they can accidentally make mistakes that will break the code. And this basically sums up the difference between smart contract paradigms. Now let's move on to the homework. Right, so this is the GitHub repo for the Plutus Pioneer program. As you can see, lecture number one is out. This is the link to the YouTube video. And so for week one, we only have one exercise and it's to essentially build the auction contract. Personally, myself and a lot of other people had problems even getting the contract to run, uh, specifically setting up our own instance of Plutus Playground. There was a lot of missing instructions on the lecture video itself. So instead of following these instructions exactly, I will branch off and pick and choose my own solutions. To quickly go over the instructions, we're going to build the English auction con smart contract. We're not going to use Cobble. No, we're going to use something called Next to build everything. And we're going to clone the Plutus repository, not the repository we're in right now, but rather the repository that has all of the helper libraries. And then once we have the Plutus repository, we're going to download and install Nix. Nix is another tool that helps us build a separate environment to help run our code. And then we're going to launch uh, the Playground server. And then we're going to connect to that server using another front end. And then at that point, we should be able to have access to the Plutus Playground. So the first thing we need to do is we need to get an environment that supports Nix. And what I mean by that specifically is you need either a Linux environment, such as Ubuntu, which is what I have right now, or you have a Mac. So I myself have a window operating system. So there were some choices I could have made. I could have installed a separate Ubuntu operating system to my machine and then dual boot into that. Instead, I chose to create a virtual box and install a Ubuntu operating system on top of it. I added a link to the description below with a helpful YouTube video that I followed to actually set up my virtual box. And so once you have a Ubuntu operating system, we need to get the repository. So we can just go to our terminal and let's just maximize this for us to see. So the first thing we need to do is we need to clone the repository, the Plutus repository. And so we need to install get. And to do that, we just type sudo app get install git. I already have it. And of course, enter your password. I already have it, so this will be super fast. And then once you have git, you can... I made a new directory called Plutus, as you can see over here. And then inside Plutus, I cloned my repository. So that command would just be get clone. And then you just want to get to the link of that repository. So back over here, we can see that the Plutus repository is over here. We copy the link, we paste it, and then we can just do get clone and the link to the Plutus repository. Since I already have it, I'm not going to do it. Cool. So as you see in my directory, I have a Plutus folder and a Plutus Pioneer program folder. We don't really need the Plutus Pioneer program folder. I just cloned that too for fun. So the next thing we need to do is we need to install Nix. So I drop this back down again. So if you go to nixos.org, you have this helpful curl command that you can use to download the application. And so you just type the command, download and install it, and then reset your terminal. And then in your next terminal instance, you'll have access to Nix. Um, you'll know how it works because if you type Nix, you have a whole bunch of commands that'll show up. Now, step three, the next thing we have to do is we need to set up our configuration for Nix. So if we go back again to our instructions, we have to set up the IOHK binary cache so that we, it, we don't take forever to build our application. So following this instruction over here on that binary cache example, we need to go to our PC Nix Nix conf. So starting out, we don't actually have a Nix folder, so we actually have to make all of this ourselves. So if we go to CD etc, I, as you can see, I already have it, but you just need to make a new directory. Um, so it's just be make dir and it's called nix. So I go to nix. And then inside nix, you need to create a uh, nix.conf. You have a lot of different ways of 
creating this file. What I did was sudo because we need administration privileges because we're in the etc folder. I use vim as my choice of text editor. I actually had to do a sudo app get install for this, but that's okay. And then I edit the file or create the file next.com. And so for the values that I used, I just simply copy and pasted it from the instructions over here. And then, and then afterwards I just hit a colon WQ to save and that's it. For those not too familiar with Vim, there are other text editors that are simple like Nano, which I think are, is more intuitive to like a notepad editor. Either way, you want to create this file. Now that you have this, you can just go back to your root directory, which you can do by doing CD and then the tilde symbol. Go back to Plutus, go back to the Plutus repository. And then uh, at this point, you have everything you need to actually start. So we just go to Plutus. Actually, before running Nick's shell, there's actually one more command we need to do. We need to first build everything inside the repo. We, so we go back to instruction and we scroll down. We'll see that there's this command we need to use called next build dash F. Uh, this is just building the Plutus core. So we copy the command, we go back to our terminal and then we paste, which is with control shift B. This will take a while, so sit tight. Um, since I already built mine, so I'm not going to run this again. And then after we have built everything, we can run Nix shell to set up our server environment. And then we need to click this plus button on the top left corner to start another instance of our terminal. And we run Nix shell again to create another environment, which we'll use as the client side to connect to our server, which then we can access from the browser. So this will take a while, so I'll cut to when it finishes. All right, so our next shell is finished. So all we need to do is we need to go to Plutus Playground Client and just run the Plutus Playground server. And this will start the server. And then for our other terminal, we'll also go to Plutus Playground Client. And, and then we'll run npm run start. So we're loading up an application that's going to connect to this server. And so we wait. All right, so now we're done compiling. And so we have a local server set up. And if you scroll up in the text, you'll find that right here, the server is located at localhost port 8009. So we just copy this with control shift C. We open up a browser, which in this instance, we have Firefox installed by default. And then we paste with control V. And there we go. We have a Plutus playground running in our background. And the final part of this exercise is that we want to run the auction script. And so it's, we go back to our example. We go to the English auction in our lecture one, go to week one, and we go to our English auction Haskell script or our Plutus script. And we can just copy everything in this code. Control C, we go back to our OS and just Control A and then Control B and we just paste everything in. Now it's important to also get rid of this module um, that's stated in the instructions. But then afterwards we just hit compile. Well, let me maximize this for us. And there you go, compilation successful. And just like in the lecture video, we didn't really go over the codes. So I'm also going to do something similar and not go over the code myself. However, we will just do a quick simulate to prove to ourselves that the code works. So as you see, we have the exact same thing as the lecture. We have wall one, wall two, we have Lovelace and T, where T is a non-fungible token that was created for this auction. So to quickly simulate this smart contract, we press a start to make a start action. We set the slot to be 20, um, so this auction lasts for 20 turns. Uh, our min bid is five. The currency symbol is 66, which is a value that was hard-coded in the contract. And the token name is T. So we can just wait a block. And let's say that while well, the two made a bid, the symbol is 66 and the token name is T and they're bidding, let's say 10. We wait again, 
And then we finally do a close action to end the bid. So we close and 66 for a symbol and our token name is T. And we wait another 10 blocks and then we hit evaluate. All right, so if we go look in our code, uh, we see now that wallet one, which originally had 10 of the T transaction is now nine and wallet two has 11. So we know that the ADA was successfully transferred. Now, before we wrap this up, you might be wondering, but Josh, I don't want to set up my own server. Is there a way I can just run the Plutus playground myself? Well, the current Plutus playground that IOHK is hosting is unfortunately not up to date. However, if you visit the Cardano developer subreddit, there's a great guy named Nick Kugel, sorry if I butcher your name, who was kind enough to actually host his own server um, at playground.plutus-community.com, which is a server that he's hosting that allows you to actually just run the playground. And so you can just go over here and then put in your own script and run it. And just as he said in his edit, have fun, but please don't be mean and do anything crazy like send a DDoS attack or anything on this guy. He's doing a great thing for the community and I would hate for him to shut this down. And that's it for the first week of the Plus Pioneer program. It's been a super great first week having Dr. Brunus talk about the different UTXOs models and how Plus plays into the Cardano blockchain. And then talk about how the Ethereum Solidity blockchain is different from the Bitcoin blockchain and Cardano itself. But the only real feedback I have is that the setup instructions has been, let's say, not very helpful. Um, a lot of the developers had to find their own solutions to set up their environment. Hopefully this video has been helpful for those of you who are working in a window environment or maybe even just a Linux or a Mac that's struggling right now to set up your own Plutus playground environment. However, if you are either unwilling or unable to set up your own playground, there are people who set up their playground online that anyone can access. So you can actually still follow along over there without having, up your, having set up your own environment. So that being said, I hope you guys are excited as I am for week two. And until then, I'll see you later.